Regular meeting number 11 will now come to order. Please stand for the playing of the national anthem. President Pro Tem Tyson, please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to welcome Reverend Tyrone Laws from New Hope Baptist Church, who's also the president of the IMA. Pastor Laws, thank you for coming back down to council. It's an honor to be here, sir. God, who is love, grace, justice, and truth, we come before you asking you to continue on in your leadership and your influence upon this great city council that they might continue to make the decisions that advantage the citizens of this city in all the vicinity area, that we might continue to grow as a city and as a people. This we ask in great humbleness and meekness and gratitude to you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Laws. Thank you. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Denziano, Tyson, President Klein. This week's communications received by the City Clerk's Office are listed on the agenda. They'll be published in the City Bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read into the record? Not at this time. Are there any resolutions by members of Council? Councilmember Elizabeth Brown. No, thank you. President Klein. Councilmember Mitch Brown. Councilmember Hardin. Councilmember Page. Councilmember Denziano. I have none. President, President Pro Tem Tyson. I don't have any resolutions this evening, but I want to recognize um, a group of individuals that are in the room today. And um, I am going to ask Mr. Michael Felding and the uh, entire team from Columbus Public Health to come towards the podium, please. And I want to recognize these individuals for the work that they have been doing for a significant amount of time in regard to the Ebola crisis that was within, this, within, the, within the world and how they were responding to it within the city of Columbus. And just want to recognize, when you hear the numbers and the information, just want to recognize what it really takes for a community to be prepared. And Mr. Michael Felding is a director of the Center of Epidemiology Preparedness and Response at Columbus Public Health. And he served as the incident commander during our Ebola response. Mr. Felding, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member uh, Tyson. And uh, good evening to all the council members today. Um, I am with Columbus Public Health, Mike Fielding. And I'm very proud to be representing this uh, powerful public health team that's up here with me today. Um, all of you should know that Columbus Public Health uh, receives reports annually about infectious diseases. And every year that's around 3,500 individual infectious uh, disease reports. 
On top of that, we uh, respond to approximately 100 infectious disease outbreaks every year. So when you think of that, and then you think about this Ebola crisis, we, we came together uh, to respond, respond appropriately to that issue. And it was the largest Ebola outbreak in history. Fortunately, in Columbus, we had no Ebola cases, but that did not mean that we couldn't or didn't have to do uh, certain duties and certain work within our community. So with partnership with the Center for Disease Control and the High Department of Health, we monitored 476 travelers. Each traveler had to be monitored for 21 days. We had 17 travelers that needed medical care. We had close to 300 Columbus Public Health employees that were engaged in one way or another, which logged over 14,000 work hours. This experience was very rewarding to us because <clears throat> we were taking care of the community, we were taking care of our residents, and we were taking care of visitors. We never forgot those that did uh, come down with the Ebola virus and die or became uh, ill, uh, but may have recovered from it. So we thought of those, we never forgot about them, and we thought of them throughout the whole world. What this experience proved to us, though, is that we have well-written response plans. We have qualified staff. We can address any public health threat in the future. So, how do we organize ourselves to be prepared for this? Each of you should have received an incident command structure chart. It's a nice colored chart for you. Um, we were in this uh, incident command structure for 15 months. We started in October 2014 and just finished in January 2016. This is a national incident management system that we must follow. Our police and fire follow this pretty much every day. Um, and we've been using it more and more. Matter of fact, we're using it for Zika and we're using incident command for the opiate crisis and so forth. But this provided us with 24 seven public health readiness and response. I'd like to introduce some of the key players um, in this incident command structure. Certainly, we always report to the health commissioner, Dr. Teresa Long, and I know she's in the audience here as well. Um, I had the honor of being the incident commander. Uh, Leslie DiDonato was the deputy incident commander. Dr. Mashika Roberts was our medical director. Nancy Bechtel and Beth Wilson were our liaison officers. Rebecca Nelson was our education and outre outreach leader. Julie Alban was our safety officer. Jose Rodriguez was our public information officer. Ryan Young was our planning section lead. Steve Kranz was our logistics section lead. Anita Clark was our finance section lead. And Elizabeth Koch, who I call our public health warrior, was our operations section lead. That's the hardest area to uh, manage is when you're in operations. So I've, I've asked her to actually come up with some kind of a symbol where she can kind of do her thing. But I don't think she's come up with that. I don't know where's the, oh, she's right behind me. She's hiding. Um, and as you can see, there's many more talented managers and frontline workers, nurses from our strategic nursing team, uh, from the Office of Infectious Disease Investigation. Uh, we have outbreak response, disease investigation specialist, and our epidemiologist, just to name a few. In closing, I want to recognize a few of our partners. We could not have done this with many, many, many partners uh, within, our or within our community. Um, but I'd like to make a shout out to our area hospital systems, Ohio Health, Ohio State University, uh, Wexter Medical Center, Mount Carmel, and Nationwide Children's Hospital. And a special shout out to our Columbus Police Department and our Columbus Fire Department. I know I saw Chief O'Connor in the audience. I saw Deputy Chief uh, Richard Bash in the audience. Uh, Chief Dem Jim Davis uh, with the EMS did an excellent job. We want that guy connected to our hip anytime we're dealing with one of these things. Um, so it was very beneficial. And City Council members, I want to thank you for the recognition. It really means a lot. And thank you for supporting us to protect health and improve the lives of the City of Columbus residents. Thank you. Sure. So, Michael, first of all, I just want to thank you for your leadership and being the incident commander during this Ebola response. I also know that um, this was you guys were on call for 66 weekends, and you had 463 days in incident command and infectious disease emergency response plan structure. And so I just want to thank you for 
the work that you did around this Ebola crisis. It is, we, it makes us feel proud as a city that certainly that we know that this team is prepared for ever there be any type of incident within our community. And that just makes not only this council feel great, I'm sure the whole city, but the people who are watching just know that there was ever something out here, that this is a great team of people and we have a real plan should that ever occur. So I really wanna thank you for um, all the work that you did. That's a lot of time to be working with this community, it took a huge effort. Um, we don't wanna minimize what you had to do. And even though I'm glad we didn't have any incidents of Ebola in our community, but we were prepared if we, we did. And certainly um, monitoring 400 and 476 individuals is tremendous just based upon how we have to monitor them. So thank you for coming. And before you, um, I'm gonna have everyone just quickly walk past and say their name because I think that you typically don't have an opportunity. Your families wanna see the work that you do each and every day. And we thank them for allowing you to be here and to be able to um, support our community. So if you can quickly walk through and say your name and you know what position you have at Columbus Public Health, that would be great. Thank you. On the mic. Hi, I'm Jane Dixon and I'm the director of the Strategic Nursing Team. Sherry Mays, Strategic Nursing Team. Vicki Kaverick, Infectious Disease Investigation, Registered Nurse. Kathy Banjoko, Outbreak Response Coordinator. Bill and Hussein, Outbreak Response. Beth Rancifer, Workforce Development Manager. Naomi Tucker, Director for the Office of Infectious Disease Investigation and a Registered Nurse. Laura Sweet, Program Manager in the Office of Infectious Disease Investigation and Registered Nurse. Joy Beard, Office, in, Office of Infectious Disease Investigation. I'm a registered nurse. Jenny Young, Registered Nurse, School Nurse Liaison. Deanna Bumgardner, I'm a Licensed Practical Nurse in the Office of Infectious Disease. Lakeisha Johnson, Registered Nurse, Program Manager in Project Love. Chica McTeer, Registered Nurse. Elizabeth Koch, Director of Outbreak Response. Anita Clark, Fiscal Team. Leslie DiDonato, Office of Emergency Preparedness Director. I'm Ryan Young. I'm a manager in the Office of Emergency Preparedness. Beth Wilson, Office of Emergency Preparedness Manager. Stephen Krantz, Emergency Preparedness Planner, Office of Emergency Preparedness. Rebecca Nelson, Administrator with Neighborhood Health. Nancy Bechtel, Assistant Health Commissioner, Chief Nursing Officer. Registered nurse. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And again, Dr. Long, thank you for your leadership. And I know you have a few comments you want to talk about regarding the Zika basics. Oh, I'm going to talk about Zika later. Okay. But um, if that's all right with you. Um, that's perfect. I apologize. President, <laughs> President Klein, members of council, Chairwoman Tyson, I just wanted to, again, uh, Thank you for celebrating the amazing achievements of this team, because um, they are amazing, and they're amazing 24-7. But I also want to really recognize our fire colleagues who are here. We have our uh, chief of the fire department who's here, Chief O'Connor, along with Dr. Kessig, um, who's been bonded at the hip with us. Um, Jim Davis, you heard about Chief Davis, and Tracy Smith is here, and others. We couldn't have, I can't tell you all the late nights that we've had, or all nights that we've had. I know um, uh, 
uh, uh, Council Member Emmett Brown will know about how that can happen, but it felt like being an intern again, and that's been, <laughs> yeah, you laugh, but Dr. Roberts and I went there, and I can't tell you all the late night calls with them and all of our hospital colleagues, all the medical direction and leadership of all of our health systems, each one of them had a an event, or more than one event, and we were on the calls with CDC, the State Health Department, and many others. It was pretty amazing. So again, this was a huge team effort for our community, and we have done, honestly, I think, a beautiful job. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Long, and certainly thank you to the Division of um, Safety and the work that they did around this issue. Lastly, on Ebola, just think about this. There were 28,637 individuals who had Ebola during this that period in the, around the world, and then we had 11,315 people die from Ebola. So, and luckily no one was in our community, but again, our hearts go out to all those families around the world and um, that um, <coughs> lost loved ones based upon this, this terrible disease. So, well, thank you again, Michael and the whole team, and um, we hope that we uh, don't have to engage you quickly for another situation, so thank you. And with that, I also have one quick announcement, is that um, the Health and Human Services Committee will ha host a hearing on this Thursday, and we will have um, legislation to approve the social, service agent, social services agency's grant funding will be on council's agenda in the next couple of weeks. In an effort for us to um, pass that legislation, each and every nonprofit organization that receives funding from the City of Columbus will have to come down and share the results of the funding that they received from um, the, from the city. The first hearing will be held on Thursday, March 3rd, and starts at 3.30, and half of the organizations will come down at that time. And then on Wednesday, March 16th, at 3.30, um, the other half will come down. And both meetings will be held here in council chambers. And um, again, if you want to come down and, and hear more about those organizations that are giving dollars, that we're giving dollars to, please come to the hearings on either of those dates. And again, it also will be recorded on CTV. And if you want to know which organizations are going to be funded on each day, feel free to call my office at 645-2932. 645-2932. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, President Pro Tem Tyson. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, Dr. Long and all of the health professionals and folks at Health. Thank you for what you do for the City of Columbus, as well as the partnership that Health has with our emergency medical professionals in the Division of Fire. Dr. Kessig, I see back there, uh, Chief O'Connor back there, Dave Montgomery, the President of Local 67. Uh, thank you for what you do for the City of Columbus and being the first front lines as we tackle a lot of these infectious diseases as they cross our borders with the international travel and international economy that we now live in, and that your uh, presence and preparedness is always sincerely and, and gratefully appreciated. Are there any other comments by uh, elected officials, Mr. Dorian? I don't see Mr. Pfeiffer or anyone from the courts. Are there any requests by members of council for the removal of an ordinance or resolution from the consent action portion of the agenda? Seeing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of the titles of 30 day legislation by the city clerk? Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Cenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. Uh, clerk, please read into the record the ordinance numbers of the 30-day legislation on tonight's agenda. Health and Human Services Committee Ordinance 398-2016, Environment Committee Ordinance 209-2016, Public Service and Transportation Committee Ordinance 415-2016, Technology Committee Ordinances 181, 206, and 394-2016, Public Utilities Committee Ordinances 16, 229, 241, 304, and 388-2016. Zoning Committee Ordinances 504, 505, and 527-2016. Thank you, Clerk Blevins. The following ordinances appear on our agenda as consent actions. Will the clerk now read into the record the ordinance numbers? Resolutions of Expression 40X, 41X, 37X, 39X-2016. Finance Committee Ordinances 288, 319, and 481-2016. Economic Development Committee Ordinance 428-2016. Environment Committee Ordinance 118-2016. Public Safety Committee Ordinances 198 and 205-2016. Public Service and Transportation Committee Ordinance 548-2016. Recreation and Parks Committee 
Ordinances 104 and 335 2016. Housing Committee Ordinances 429, 430, 431 2016. Technology Committee Ordinances 183, 197, 199, 200 2016. Public Utilities Committee Ordinances 38, 131, 174, 204, 208, 213, 214, 218, 223. 225, 226, 296, and 450 2016. Thank you, Clerk. May I have a motion for approval of these items designated as consent action? Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. We'll now proceed to the second reading uh, of 30-day tabled and emergency legislation. The first committee is the Finance Committee, chaired by President Pro Tem Tyson. President Pro Tem Tyson, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Klein. The first ordinance is 0324-2016. It's to authorize the Finance Management Director to enter into two contracts for the option to purchase office chairs in with King Business Interiors, Inc. and Continental Office Furniture Corporation to waive relevant provisions of the Columbus City Codes relating to the competitive bidding process and to authorize expenditure of $2 to establish the contracts from the general fund and to declare an emergency. This legislation is to establish two UTC contracts for the purchase of office chairs for all the city agencies. Um, this legislation, the estimated annual amount is $400,000. And Director Lombardi, can you please share why we are waiting competitive bidding? Sure. President Klein, President Pro Tem Tice, and other members of council. This ordinance allows city agencies to order office chairs and accessories from various contracts. Currently, the city code does not allow the city to award the same item to multiple suppliers. To allow the purchasing office to award more than one item to multiple sources, the relevant provisions of the Columbus City Code relating to competitive bidding must be waived. Awarding this contract to two suppliers gives the city agencies more flexibility to purchase office chairs and accessories from various manufacturers and encourages greater contract opportunities. Thank you. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Seeing that, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Harden, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. The next ordinance is 0478-2016. and is to authorize the finance and management director on behalf of the fleet management division to establish purchase orders from previously established universal term contracts for the purchase of vehicles for use by various city departments with buyers Ford, statewide Ford Lincoln, and Rikert Properties to authorize the finance and management director to establish purchase orders with Insight Public Sector for the purchase of Panasonic HD arbitrators and necessary hardware accessories to be installed on the police interceptors in accordance with the terms and conditions of the state of Ohio's cooperative contracts and to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of $4,135,380 from the special income tax fund and to declare an emergency. And this really is phase one of our vehicle acquisitions. This legislation is again to establish purchase orders for the purchase of automobiles and automobiles and light duty trucks for various departments within the city of Columbus. Buyers forward for the acquisition of automobiles and light duty trucks by the Fleet Management Division for subsequent dis distribution to various city departments, statewide Fort Lincoln for the depart for the department for the safe for the safety division for the police department and then also Rikert properties also for the division of police. Um, the insight public sector for the purchase of the Panasonic HD arbitrators and necessary hardware and accessories to be installed on the police interceptors. These vehicles are purchased as replacements for older high mileage and high maintenance vehicles that are currently in service. And with that, I would move for passage. Brown, Brown, Harden, Page, Cinciano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. I would like to move to Health and Human Services. Okay. So the first or the ordinance in um, health is ordinance number 0492-2016. 
to authorize the finance and managing director to enter into a contract on behalf of the Office of Construction Management and General Temperature Control for acquisition and installation of a backup chiller at Columbus Public Health, 240 Parsons Avenue, to authorize the expenditure of $460,000 from the Construction Management Capital Improvement Fund and to weigh the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code, Chapter 329, and to declare an emergency. Um, Director Lombardi, do you want to share some information regarding this this piece of um, this ordinance, please? President Klein, President Pro Tem Tyson, other members of council. Currently, there are two chillers are in operation at the Department of Health facility located at 240 Parsons Avenue. In late 2015, a condition assessment was performed on one of these chillers. Initially, it was thought that the construction management office could perform repairs for the mechanical items and return the chiller to its normal operating use. However, during that assessment, it was determined that the chiller had deteriorated more than we had expected, and due to the long lead time to receive this equipment, which is approximately 13 weeks, it was in the best interest to solicit informal quotes from three HVAC firms and award to the lowest bidder. Had a formal bid process been undertaken, it is possible that the chiller would not have been in place prior to this summer months. Because an informal bid process was used, the Department of Finance and Management is asking council to waive the competitive bidding requirements of the Columbus City Code. This unit will be delivered and installed before the summer months. Thank you, Director Lombardi. And we, so we, Director and I had a conversation in regards to, um, obviously, we're waiving competitive bidding and was necessary in this case just because we want to make sure that we have the building being air conditioned, not only for the employees that are there, but also the thousands of individuals that come to Columbus Public Health for services. And we want to make sure that they're going to be in a climate that would be conducive to them continuing to be healthy. And so we are um, asking for the way of competitive bidding. We also have asked the director, because I don't like to waive competitive bidding unless it's absolutely necessary, that in the future that we can start to work on a pro process of having a, you know, a really good understanding of um, just basically looking at our facilities and see maybe what, what are the needs of those facilities so that we have enough lead time that we can bid out those these kinds of jobs. And so he has committed that they would be working on that, and that way we will um, not be behind, would you say, the eight ball and trying to get things done. So we've committed to that. And so with the explanation um, by Director Lombardi, I'm going to ask my council members if they would approve this legislation um, for um, Columbus Public Health and... Um, so I would ask your, your support in this. Second. Brown, Brown, Harden, Page, Cinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. And the last um, ordinance I have in my committee this evening is 043. 6-2016 is to authorize and direct the Board of Health to enter into a contract with WBNS TV Inc. to continue a public awareness campaign to address obesity in Central Ohio, to authorize a total expenditure of $75,000 from the Health Special Revenue Fund and to waive competitive bidding provisions of, of Columbus, City, Columbus City Code 329. This ordinance is really important so that we can commit, keep making sure that we're going to commit to be fit for the residents of our city. Uh, our, our, the 10 healthiest countries in the world, United States does not rank in the top 10. We are at 34. The average, with the average life expectancy of 79 years, a report commissioned by the Columbus Foundation and the Osteopathic Heritage Foundation found that in Franklin County, the life expectancy for men is 64 years for men and 71 years of age for women. And these disparities are particularly prevalent in underserved communities where race, ethnicity, and poverty are likely to pay or play a role in these projections. Obesity, heart disease, and diabetes are just a few of the factors that impact our community's ability to remain fit. And so with this program, certainly we'll be able to keep, continue to educate and inform our residents about healthy foods, nutrition, and physical activity. Um, this average, the web advertising with this contract will focus on issues such as preventing flu, 
Water First for Thirst, Art Walks, Twilight Ride, Farmers Markets, Let's Move Events, and Immunizations. And the weekly email newsletter reaches about 7,300 subscribers. And lastly, the stories at um, 10 TV with Jeff Hogan have focused on these areas, toddler nutrition, workplace workouts, art walks, the family fitness challenge, fitness and aging, walk to school event at Columbus City Schools, bike lanes and infant mortality, and the safe sleep campaign launch. And so with that, I would ask my colleagues, based on the things I've just mentioned, that you would support this legislation um, to continue to support the Commit to Be Fit. And I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Harden, Page, Denziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. And lastly, <laughs> Dr. Long has some comments she wants to make on the Zika. Dr. Long. Uh, Council President, Klein, Council Chair Tyson, and members of Council. I'm not sure I want to talk about this, but clearly um, <laughs> Committee Chair Tyson asked if I would share just a few thoughts with you about Zika and, again, what we are doing in this community. So first of all, I did share with you um, a card, an information card, that actually we have entered into a relationship with all of our health systems as well as Franklin County Public Health. So this is a common informational um, document. Again, talks a little bit about the basics and again talks about mosquitoes talks about there being no um, vaccine or medicine at this point uh, about our concern and the association between pregnancy and potential birth defects it also speaks um, about the countries and there are many both Central American Latin American um, and Caribbean countries that now have um, Zika virus presence, and then the concerns also about sexual transmission. You can see on the back of the card some of the specific groups that we are trying to um, have become aware, obviously pregnant women, uh, men who have traveled to areas where Zika is prevalent, and then again, and it will be come more uh, prevalent, and we think there'll be more questions about how do we prevent uh, mosquito bites, both when people travel, but actually, um, if you don't know, there are two potential, or there are two mosquitoes that can spread this virus, one that is known to spread it in the countries I've mentioned, um, that's Aedes aegypti. We do not have that mosquito here in Columbus and Franklin County or in Ohio, but we do have Aedes albopictus that is also able to spread this virus, at least in the laboratory. So again, we are concerned about what this could mean for our community into the summer when we have mosquitoes. So again, I appreciate the interest. We already have been very active, as you're probably aware, we would jump on something like this because there's lots of interest and concern. We have been alerting our area physicians. Um, um, we've had numerous health advisories go to them with our Centers for Disease Control guidance. We have convened all of our health system partners um, and other public agencies, and we are going to continue to communicate with one voice so there is not confusion about what is being said here in Columbus and Franklin County. We have convened all of our area colleges and universities. We'll actually be having a, uh, I don't know if I'd call it a summit with them. We'll be having a, another meeting with them as a group on Monday. I can tell you that Ohio State has taken these materials and and no surprise, they have them now with uh, scarlet and gray. But nonetheless, it's the exact same materials and the same icons. They will be sending that out to their entire university population. Actually, I guess they did it today. So again, we continue to work together with them. We are, of course, facilitating all of the patient specimens that will go to the Centers for Disease Control. That is the only place where any testing from Ohio can go at this point. Um, we will, of course, and we have already been involved, but we will conduct the disease investigations that would need to occur around any Zika exposures. Um, of course, we have a mosquito program, but we are continuing to evaluate and then plan for our expanded mosquito control efforts into this summer. And then finally, we will be launching an educational campaign for all of our public. Um, so stay tuned. But clearly, we will need everyone's help to try and eliminate standing water or the places where indeed mosquitoes can breed. So with that, I'm certainly willing to take any questions. You'll certainly be hearing more. Um, as we say, the first time we have a case that's uh, right here in Columbus, we'll probably get some more interest. And obviously, as we move into mosquito season, we'll probably see more interest as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Long, for this presentation. And just lets our um, <clears throat> listening and viewing audience know that we are prepared. We're, thank you very much. That's all I have.
Thank you, President Pro Tem Tyson. Dr. Long, if, if I may ask a question about Zika, uh, and I'm not sure if this is the correct terminology, but what's the incubation period of the Zika virus? How long if someone is, uh, in, is bitten by a mosquito that has uh, the Zika virus, how long is it always and forever? What's, what's the incubation period? Is that the right word, incubation? Or? Well, there's lots of different questions, and actually, honestly, we don't know all the answers yet, Council President Klein, so thank you for the question. What we do know is that um, it appears as if from the time of the bite to the time of actual symptoms, and again, sadly, I think it's on the fact sheet that only 20% of those persons who actually become infected actually have symptoms. So it's, again, a small percentage. So uh, that, of course, adds to the concern. But in those cases, it's actually anywhere from a few days to a week or so. Could be even two weeks for an incubation. That's before symptoms would arise. Then we're concerned um, for probably between, and again, we're saying two to 12 weeks. Um, for someone as far as clearing the virus, though we don't know that. We know that, again, um, usually people who have symptoms connected to the virus actually only have those for about a week, a week to 10 days. Um, so again, there's lots of different numbers being thrown out. What we also know is that men who have had the infection um, are able to transmit this through their semen um, for at least this um, 12 weeks and maybe longer. And that's one of the questions we don't know. So indeed, some of the guidance um, has to do with women who are pregnant or considering becoming pregnant to countries that are having um, a lot of or actually actual transmission of this virus. There is guidance, national, federal guidance, not to travel to that area at this point in time. There's also guidance around um, men and their use and active use correctly every time, the use of a condom, if they would be having sexual relationships with someone who is pregnant or intending to become pregnant soon, because again of the concern about sexual transmission. Uh, we don't have all the answers yet. There's a lot of active investigation going on. New case reports continue to come out. There was some concerning information that was just released this past Friday from the Centers for Disease Control. And again, we are still trying to determine, and I, I should say we collectively, is this the virus that actually is causing the birth defects, the microcephaly, um, and or the um, neurologic problems, the Guillain-Barre syndrome? So happy to keep bringing that information to you. We're trying to send everyone back to the Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization websites. But again, we are, are fielding all kinds of questions related to this. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Long. Our next committee is the Public Safety Committee. That's chaired by Councilmember Mitch Brown. Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Uh, tonight, I have four ordinances in public safety. The first ordinance is ordinance number 0264-2016 to authorize the Director of Public Safety to modify the current contract with Med 3000 Inc. for the EMS billing collection and reporting services for the Division of Fire to authorize the expenditure of $1.6 million for collection of services and $100,000 for refunds from the General Fund and to declare emergency. I am move for passage. Brown, Brown, Harden, Page, Denziano, Tyson, President Klein. Second, I would, at uh, this particular time, I'd like to invite Detective Jack Addington and Deputy Chief Bash to come up to the podium. Uh, ordinance number 0271-2016 to authorize the director, the director of Public Safety to enter into a contract with Leeds Online LLC for access to the company's automated scrap materials and used goods transaction information management system to authorize the expenditure of $64,400 from the general fund and to declare emergency. First, I'd ask to move this ordinance from the table. Brown, Brown, Harden, Page, Cinziano, Tyson, President Klein. And now I'd like to have Detective Addington speak to the issue, please. We've had leads online for several years, but just to give you an idea, back before 2007, the pawn shop detectives would have to go around to the different pawn shops, pick up the slips, bring them in, more or less they would go into a filing system, that's what I was told to use. It went into a box, and then it went out <laughs> to the warehouse where we kept the boxes of items. Uh, we purchased Leeds Online to do the scrapyards when we passed the scrapyard ordinance in 2007. Um, they wanted me to show how easy it works, 
it's, it's hard to describe, except you can search someone by name, you can search someone by their driver's license number, a description of the item, the serial number, the scrap amount, the scrap quantity. Uh, several years back, give me a second here. The lady was raped, an older lady. They took her cell phone. Using leads online, the homicide detective, or the assault detectives, were able to put in the serial number to the phone. I do not type that fast, sorry. I'm going to have to log back in. Yes, I told you I'd have to do that. <laughs> this is what happens when you don't take typing in high school. <laughs> Now, what was I going to need typing for? I was going to be a baseball player. See how that panned out. Did I go back far enough? Did not. A case number is required no matter what. It doesn't matter what you put in there. If you're searching, like you have a report assigned to you, you would put your report, and then you can go back and search back through them. It always works easier when no one's watching. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Ironically, it doesn't like leap years. It doesn't like that. And of course, I'm not going to get it to work. But in 2007, we uh, purchased leads online where it allows uh, one detective to make multiple searches by name, I'm batting a thousand so far, aren't I? Yeah, hey, my baseball career, yes. It's thinking. Give me an example here. Mr. Morton was a very busy man. He was part of a burglary ring. A detective a person called and said their items were stolen. I was able to match items up by serial numbers. Mr. Morton led me to several other suspects which allowed me to share information with other detectives. And uh, the burglary ring was actually caught breaking into a pawn shop. Hmm. The irony of it. Hmm. We have 41 pawn shops, 19 scrap yards, and there are 50 secondhand dealers that report the leads online. Uh, I did this search last week on the 23rd. There were well over 1,400 items if you were to come back and just leaf through each one of those pieces of paper just to try to find one serial number, it would be hours of work as to where one can detective can sit and search leads online for these items. And as you can, you can go back so many years, you can search by his ID number,
It also allows you to... Mr. Morton was actually a suspect and we had after other detectives looking for him. You could put his driver's license number in and save a search and it'll let you know next time he goes to a pawn shop or a scrapyard. Um, it's hard to describe just how many things that Leeds Online is able to do. Uh, when we purchased this, we were the only one in town that had it. Uh, we showed it. We didn't really show it. We just showed how well it worked. As of this time, there are 223 jurisdictions in the state of Ohio. I have my searches narrowed down to just the counties and the surrounding counties. You can search by Franklin County. You can search by the state of Ohio. Uh, just last week, I had a detective from Gallia County, which I believe is down on the Ohio River, call and he found one of his guns, stolen guns, in one of our pawn shops. So it's a force multiplier by, it's even, it's hard to explain. It just allows that so many detectives. And it's not limited to the pawn shop detectives or the scrapyard detectives. It's limited to all the police officers. And we also have the fire, uh, the arson detectives, because they have law enforcement powers also. <clears throat> I still would like to find, <laughs> I found it last week. Detective, if you can't find it, let me elaborate for you as well as having Deputy Chief Bash here so we could be uh, use everyone's time wisely. What's significant with the use of Leads Online is that it affords one detective the opportunity to search all the different pawn shops whenever there's been a crime committed and someone takes a particular piece of per person's property and turns it into a pawn shop that we're able to find and search that system to determine whether or not they have or have not been involved in committing of a crime. Chief, if you have anything else you wish to elaborate. I do. Thank you, Councilman and uh, Council President. Uh, it is very important for us to remember that it, this technology is not just to allow us to put additional people in jail. It allows us to find the stolen material from someone's home, something that might be very sentimental in value, that we're able to return to that person before it gets either melted down or sold someplace else. In addition, uh, the detective mentioned a, a violent rape that was solved just because of that. So we have access, unfortunately, many criminals cre uh, commit more than just theft acts. Uh, they commit violent acts as well, and it allows us to put those pieces together and ultimately protect our citizens and get them off the street. In considering this legislation, I would also like to draw attention to a piece of state legislation that would hinder our ability to accomplish the goals of Leeds Online. Newly introduced Senate Bill 270. This legislation, if passed, would effectively ban our safety forces' use of this technology. This would undo the leaps of forward that our city's law enforcement have made in solving crimes and returning stolen property to its rightful owners. I urge the Senate to carefully consider the ill effects that this legislation could potentially have on our capabilities as well as on the 223 other law enforcement agencies that currently use this technology to help their respective communities. Leads Online has helped pawn shops, scrap metal facilities, and others become important partners, while local law enforcement is yet another tool to get the job done for our division of police. In my capacity as a member of city council, I will continue to work with our safety forces and be an advocate for them. In doing this, I will do all I can to be sure that they have all the tools they need to get the job done. If there are no further questions, I move for passage. Before we uh, get a vote on this piece of legislation. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Detective. Um, just so I understand it correctly, because it seemed a little counterintuitive and devoid of common sense, that the Leads Online system that's available to our law enforcement personnel is now under attack through a Senate bill, and the Senate bill is going to prohibit law enforcement from searching for possible stolen items through the Leads Online system that, in this instance, that, that you've noted has solved a rape case in the city of Columbus? Yes, sir. It will prohibit uh, pawn shops and other secondhand stores from reporting to a third party. And they would like to go back to prior to 2007 when they sent us boxes of pieces of paper for detectives to sift through. 
That's correct. Is there any indication why the the Ohio Senate would? Now, I'm assuming you're the third party in this instance. The third no, party. No, so the, the third party is Leads Online. That's oh, the company that we're okay. contracting with. Okay, so the Leads Online is the third party. Yes, um, and any indication to either you or Director Speaks of how this bill came to fruition? Because as as I noted, it seems to be something that is uh, impractical and devoid of common sense. Uh, President Klein, law enforcement couldn't agree with you more uh, in that statement. The state senate should respect municipal home rule. Uh, and should aid us in solving crime and returning stolen property to its rightful owner instead of promoting and funding technology, uh, instead of trying to ban technology. It, it's, it's ludicrous. Kind of, I, I appreciate that, uh, direct, uh, Director Speaks and uh, Chief, thank you so much. Any other questions or comments for you? There's, this has been moved and seconded. Hey, clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Harton, Page, Cinciano, Tyson, President Klein. Legislation passed. Thank you. Also, President Klein, ordinance number 0312-2016 to authorize the Director of Public Safety Director to enter a contract with the YMCA of Central Ohio to provide a safe and supervised environment where Columbus police officers can drop off students that are truant from Columbus schools to authorize a total expenditure of 125000 from the law enforcement seizure funds and the general fund and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Harton, Page, Stinziano, Tyson, President Klein. And finally, ordinance number 0441-2016 to authorize and direct the Director of Public Safety to contract with the Franklin County Board of Commissioners and to expend funds for the use of the Franklin County Correction Centers for the housing of prisoners to authorize the expenditure of $3.8 from the General Fund and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions, I also move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Council President, again, I want to thank uh, President, the Deputy Chief Bash and uh, Jack Addington for coming down. Again, they were showing and demonstrating how a very, very old, complicated process can be simplified with the use of technology, though there are others who wish to go back to the old way of doing business, and we don't want to do that. Thank you very, very much. The next committee is the Public Service and Transportation Committee. Councilmember Shannon Harden chairs that committee. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, President Klein. This evening in Public Service and Transportation Committee, uh, the, the first two ordinances I'll read are uh, just two plats. Uh, the city are accepting uh, 0422-2016 to accept the plat titled Resubdivision of Part of Joe L. Akers from Homewood Corporation and Ohio Corporation by Jim Lipnos, President Owner of the Platted Land. Uh, first, I'd request to amend emergency. Brown, Brown, Harton, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. And move for passage. Brown, Brown, Harton, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Second is 0423-2016 to accept the plat title The Village at Abbey Trail, Section 4 from Fisher Development Company, a Kentucky corporation by Todd E. Huss, president owner of the platted land. Again, I'd meant to uh, request a to emergency. Brown, Brown, Harden, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. And, re and move for passage. Brown, Brown, Harton, Page, Cinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Uh, and lastly, I have 0433-2016 to authorize the Director of Public Service to grant consent and propose cooperation with the Director of the Ohio Department of Transportation, State of Ohio, for the design and construction of the FRA-23-7.96 uh, bridge repair project, which consists of improvements to the South High Street Bridge over State Route 104 and declare an emergency. For those of us who live south of downtown, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we can remember when uh, a bridge hit uh, the, uh, a truck hit the bridge uh, over 104. 
uh, temporarily shutting down the bridge. Uh, we are just authorizing the public service director to continue to work with the director of the Department of uh, Ohio Department of Transportation. Um, they quickly uh, did work over that weekend and got the bridge reopened, which helped a lot of folks uh, get back and forth to work uh, quicker, like myself. Um, and uh, are now moving to uh, do long longer term repairs uh, for the bridge, um, like replace the deck and structural steel. And so I want to thank um, uh, my public service department and certainly the Ohio Department of Transportation for speedy work uh, for our residents. Uh, if there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you, President Klein. That's all I have in my committees this evening. Thank you, Councilmember Hardin. Our next committee is the Housing Committee. Councilmember Jaisa Page chairs that committee. Councilmember, floor is yours. Thank you, President Klein. Tonight in Housing, we have Ordinance 400-2016 to authorize the Director of the Department of Finance and Management to expend $103,753.17, or so much thereof as may be necessary, from the Community Development Block Grant and Neighborhood Stabilization Program Grants to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to enter into a contract with Amer National Community Services, LLC, to fund the first year of a two-year contract with Amer National Community Service, LLC, which provides servicing of housing and commercial loans and to declare an emergency. We do have a speaker this evening on this ordinance who is for it. I'd like to call Mr. Nathaniel George Wilkins to the podium. Sixteen twelve Arlington Avenue, Mr. Lieutenant George Wilkins, uh, the chairman of solely vacant and abandoned property. First of, um, I would just like to um, see exactly more money instead of hundred thousand dollars, maybe uh, seven seven hundred fifty uh, fifty eight dollars and eighty something cent in seventy five. Um, I would love to see more money for this. And I think it will be a good cause for what you do. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins, and thank you for your support of this ordinance. Director Shoney, do you have anything to add? Thank you, uh, President Klein, Councilmember Page, uh, members of council. This contract is actually for our servicing of our loan portfolio, not only for the housing program, but for the economic development program. We choose to outsource this um, function because, frankly, the, this is one where the private sector has greater expertise than we do, and so we go out and get uh, better services than we can provide in-house. Thank you, Director. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. And the final ordinance in housing this evening is 482-2016 to authorize the appropriation of $1,367,938 from the unappropriated balance of the Land Management Fund to the Department of Development to provide funds for the administration of the Land Redevelopment Office and related projects and to declare an emergency. I would just like to urge all my colleagues to support this ordinance. It is in support of the work that our land bank is doing and um, in working under leadership of Director Shoney and City Attorney Pfeiffer. We all know how important the land bank is to revitalizing our communities and our neighborhoods that are suffering from the blight and vacant and abandoned properties. And again, I'm just really proud of the land bank and the work that they're doing. And if there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Hardin, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. That's all I have, President Klein. Thank you, Councilmember Page. The final committee tonight is technology. Uh, Councilmember Stenziano chairs that committee. Mr. Stenziano, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, President Klein. Tonight in technology, we have Ordinance 361-2016 
to authorize the director of the Department of Technology to continue an agreement with Ornet slash OSU for existing VMware software licensing, maintenance and support services to waive the competitive bidding provisions of Columbus City Code, to authorize the expenditure of $65,919.45 from the Department of Technology Information Services Division, Information Services Operating Fund, and declare an emergency. Um, this ordinance uh, will allow, the software will allow the department to reduce the cost of data systems, reduce power consumption and cooling requirements, and provide further capabilities for recovery and availability of information systems. It's an ongoing project and allows the department to save taxpayer dollars by reducing costs of software licensing and hardware purchases. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Harden, Page, Stanziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you, President Klein. That is all we have in technology this evening. Thank you, Council Member. Is there any other business to come before Council before we adjourn? Seeing none, uh, can I have a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll for the adjournment. We'll reconvene at 6.30, uh, but we'll take non-agenda items speak, uh, quickly, non-agenda speakers momentarily. Brown, Brown, Harton, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. We stand adjourned. Our first speaker, not agenda, is. <laughs> Regular meeting number 12 will now come to order. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Harton, Page, Cinziano, Tyson, President Klein. Are there any communications and reports received by the clerk? No, there are not. Are there any first reading of 30-day legislation? No, there are none. We'll go directly to zoning. Councilmember Page chairs zoning. Councilmember Page, floor is yours. Thank you, President Klein. Before beginning the zoning agenda, I'll briefly explain the rules of council as pertaining to speaking before council on zonings and variances. We permit three speakers on each side, three proponents and three opponents, and we ask that they limit their remarks to three minutes on each side, and we provide an opportunity for rebuttal from the applicant. On the advice of the city attorney's office, we ask that anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against any council variance, including staff, Please stand and raise your right hand to be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. I will. Thank you all. We have our first ordinance this evening, 037-2016, to rezone 5372 Central College Road, 43081, being 85.4 acres located on the north side of Central College Road, 3,040 feet west of Harlem Road from Northeast Neighborhood Edge, NG Neighborhood General, and NC Neighborhood Center Districts to NE Neighborhood Edge, NG Neighborhood General, and NC Neighborhood Center Districts. The applicant is in my homes of Central Ohio, care of Laura McGregor Comac Attorney. The proposed use is a single and multi-unit residential development. The City Department's recommendation is approval. Rocky Fork Blacklick Accord Implementation Panel recommended approval. I would like to briefly ask for uh, staff presentation. I know we have a couple of speakers on this ordinance. Good evening. Um, I'd also like to mention that the Development Commission recommended approval in October 2015. Uh, the site is undeveloped and zoned in the NE Neighborhood Edge, NG Neighborhood General, and NC Neighborhood Center districts. This request will reallocate the zoning districts with an increase in land zoned in the NE Neighborhood Edge district and decreases in the NG and NC districts. The reallocation of the current traditional neighborhood development districts will not in negatively impact the existing surroundings and will allow the applicant to pursue their marketing and design objectives while maintaining the goals of the traditional neighborhood development. The proposed TND commits to a maximum of 482 units, which is uh, an overall decrease of 26 units with a density change from 5.94 to 5.64 units to, to the acre and an increase in open space of 0.24 acres for a total of 22.6 acres. The proposal remains consistent with the land use recommendations of the Rocky Fork Black Lake Accord and the traditional neighborhood development is comparable with the zoning and development patterns of the area. And uh, as Council Member Page mentioned, the Rocky Fork Black Lake Accord panel did recommend approval of this request and therefore staff's recommendation is for approval. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Pine. Are there any questions? 
I would like to ask the applicant to speak briefly. Thank you, Attorney Komek. Good evening, Council President Klein, members of Council, Laura McGregor Komak. I'm here on behalf of MI Homes. Uh, the landowner is Homewood Corporation. Um, I apologize for the coughing this evening and my little uh, cough drop. The, this is the third time I've actually appeared before council since 2005 on this property. Homewood Corporation was one of the original three developers that um, had the vision and the guidance of council at that time um, to adopt these you know, large future development areas for the city of Columbus. In large part, this zoning has remained the same for the last now 12 years. Um, with components significantly single family, um, a large contingent of multifamily. Um, the main purpose for the ordinances before you this evening is to eliminate alley loaded lots which have not been selling in our market for the last two years and change. Instead, we are replacing those with front loaded garages, meaning they come right off of your main front street. Um, typically, those are slightly wider lots, and that's why you see the reduction that Shannon mentioned in overall units. The other thing this plan allows us to do is uh, preserve an additional five acres of the densely wooded area in the northwest corner of the site. Um, and it's really the extension. Um, it, you know, the site plan that uh, Shannon has provided, you see, uh, we did this zoning back in 2005 as well, that was the Dominion Homes. This is an extension of Upper Albany West. This will be an MI extension of this development. So this neighborhood is actually extending somewhat east. Um, east of Hamilton Road, um, again, is, is single family development. One other thing that I want to mention, uh, Homewood, MI, Dominion, and a number of other developers since 2004 are the initial partners to the Northeast MOU and the first pay-as-we-grow district. So these folks have invested lots of time and money in making sure that the infrastructure goes along with our development. And so that's why you have seen the improvements to Central College Road, you have seen the improvements to Warner Road, and in the next year or two, you will see the extension of Hamilton Road um, through the Hellebrecker site and align with the other developments that are um, to our south. I'd be pleased to answer any questions that you have about the specifics um, or come back after our speaker. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to ask Mr. Mark Towers to come to the podium. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Towers, and you have three minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I happen to live, I border the uh, west end of this new project. Um, I guess the variance is to not use the TOT um, plan the way they are currently are now. Is that true? Does anybody know? You can continue speaking and we'll answer okay, any questions that's fine. afterwards. Yeah. yeah uh, well, if that's the case, I, you know, I, would, I just don't care for it. But the other thing is the whole, um, there seems to be no plan for any uh, green trees left in this environment. Everything seems to be knocked down. And that seems to be an issue. That's the main problem. And I just see multiple plans where, uh, over the years, where the, there is a green space, a buffer, at, on the west end, and there are large lots. Now there's multi uh, th three story lots, uh, three story buildings for future use. So it, it's it's plants kind of changing a lot, and they're not very um, they're a little sketchy at this point. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Well, Mr. Tard, do you have additional time for you? Well, the main thing is if somebody would do an environmental study, we lost, a, there were a lot of wildlife in the area, all the deer and um, birds seem to be chased away from this project. Well, thank you. Thank you. Attorney Komek. Yes. I can answer those questions. Um, thank you. I did speak with, um, uh, the speaker this evening and a number of neighbors about exactly what we're doing. There is a variance to eliminate a tot lot. Those are the wee little baby lots. And that is because we have one two blocks to the west. And so each community is developed with sidewalks. And the idea of preserving an additional five acres of the trees was seen as um, just a weighing of benefits there when we had a tot lot in the existing MI uh, development. Um, so 
a couple things. We've been doing this project so long that the focus of the environmental um, concerns has gone from salamanders, which we used to study in the EPA, to now bats. And so the reason they have seen a reduction in the trees, it's honest to goodness truth, because you study the water quality of development, is we're in the season where you can take down the trees safely and not disturb either the Indiana or the brown bats. So that's why we've seen that activity um, recently, it, because we could build the subdivision right now as it exists without these tweaks to it. Um, so they did start within the prescribed time limit by law. Um, there are a number of green spaces. I was just looking to see if you have a map, but there are a number of green spaces preserved. Um, this has been to the Rocky Fork Black Lake Accord, I don't know, six times now. The main focus was to keep green strips through the middle and de define a corridor. That's in the Rocky Fork Black Lake Accord plan. We also preserved extensive areas where the creek actually comes to our property here. And um, over time, those will be dedicated to the city of Columbus. Um, and as far as other designated areas, we've got uh, one, two, uh, three, four. There, I believe there are five total either larger parks, neighborhood greens, pocket parks, or civic spaces allocated within, these, um, within this part of the development. So we've hit all of the high points, um, as many as we can. I know that um, development in your backyard is a kind of a startling thing when, if you've lived there for a while. Um, so I certainly appreciate the gentleman's points, but um, we've kind of been working on this for a while. It's been, it's been scheduled for a while. So I believe also um, where, um, and I'm sorry, I forget his last name, the, where the alley loaded lots in MI come up to our alley, so it'll be back to back alleys. Uh, there is a proposed fence, um, which is not usual. It's not normal for TND developments. We don't divide neighborhoods by fences in that regard, but there was a concern early on, um, so I think we agreed to that during the last zoning. I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, ha have you been working with Columbus Recreation and Parks as far as the, I know that there's like a land grant ordinance that we have and like the top lots just to make sure that there is adequate green space and recreational space in your community? Yes, so um, Rex and Park staff reviews and has approved every single one of our zonings every time we have brought it up. Um, the balance of what you try to do is around your density, you give them the bigger squares and areas. So that's what you see on the west side of Hamilton Road. Um, and again, that's been in place for, um, geez, 10, 12 years. Um, to, this site plan captures every goal of the Rocky Fork Black Lake Accord plan in terms of preservation of natural features in, t in both corners, um, the retention of a green corridor, and then these pocket parks that are supposed to be useful areas, to your point, um, meeting those recs and parks needs. So. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Well, Council President, I would first like to request to amend the ordinance as submitted to the clerk. Brown, Brown, Harden, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. And based on the testimony of Attorney Comac and staff for approval and the Rocky Fork Black Lake Accord implementation panel recommendation approval, I would move for passage. Brown, Brown, Harden, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Thank you. And our final ordinance this evening is a companion piece 377-2016 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3320.13A13 administration, 3320.17B8 civic spaces and civic buildings, and 3320.19B81920 private buildings of the city codes for the property located at 5372 Central College Road, 43081 to permit 59.1% of the TND project area to be in the NE Neighborhood Edge District <coughs> to eliminate the playground requirement and to increase the permitted percentage of frontage and maximum setback for garages for a TND development in the NE Neighborhood Edge, NG Neighborhood General, and NC Neighborhood Center Districts established by rezoning application Z15-034. The applicant is again in my homes of Central Ohio, care of Laura McGregor Comac, attorney. The proposed use is a single and multi-unit residential development. The city department's recommendation is approval. Rocky Fork Black Lake Accord implementation panel recommended approval. We do not have any speakers on this ordinance and I would like to move for passage. 
Brown, Brown, Harden, Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Legislation passed. Thank you, President Klein. That is all we have in zoning this evening. Thank you, Chair Page. Any other business to come before council? I do have one note, and that's uh, we made an adjustment to the council meeting schedule, and we will not meet next Monday, March 7th. But we will meet on March 14 and March 21 as previously scheduled, and we'll add an additional meeting on March 28. Uh, any other business? Seeing none, we stand adjourned if there's a motion for adjournment. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Brown, Brown, Hart and Page, Stenziano, Tyson, President Klein. Adjourned.